first of all, I'm going to back up and give you a little bit of background material uh, about the search for life beyond Earth. Um, so many of you know uh, probably that E.T. first visited Earth um, in about uh, 2500 BC and built the pyramids in Egypt and then came back a few thousand years later to build uh, matching pyramids on the other side of the world in Mexico. Uh, and then in 1947, um, E.T. had an unfortunate accident over the New Mexico desert and ended up being dissected in a lab somewhere in New Mexico. Uh, but recently, um, E.T. has actually been spending some time flying around above uh, the town where I grew up, Liverpool, in, in northwest England. And uh, as you'll see from this uh, very amazing footage here, this uh, <laughs> UFO that you can see flying here, uh, the 28-year-old mom and her husband were standing there in the backyard having a smoke. And my husband said, look at that. That's how they speak where I grew up. Uh, fortunately, I moved away and uh, sort of lost the accent a little bit. And then more recently, uh, this is actually sort of a more convincing UFO here. I quite like this one, actually. This, is the, this was uh, in Kentucky a few years back. Many people saw this. Um, and of course, it is an unidentified flying object. Every object that's unidentified is a UFO until somebody comes along and identifies it. And this turned out to be uh, Google's Loon project, which you may have heard of. They're trying to bring internet to remote areas. And unfortunately, they lost one of their balloons and it ended up uh, flying across the country before they were able to retrieve it. So, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff going on out there, but we shouldn't necessarily attribute everything that we don't understand, lights in the sky and this kind of thing, to alien visitations. I'm not sure aliens would fly across the galaxy just to hover over Liverpool. Um, <laughs> and we've never retrieved a gear shifter from an extraterrestrial spacecraft. I mean, that would be a really kind of fun thing to analyze in the lab. If they did come over here and crash, it would be really fun to sort of get our hands on, on some of those materials. So there is a laugh factor uh, sort of due to the pseudoscience that kind of accompanies the search for life beyond Earth. But I want to take us to some serious science and some serious scientists who are working to try and really answer this age-old question, are we alone in the universe? So probably uh, 40 years ago, if you'd said you thought there were planets outside our own, own solar system, people might have laughed at you for going to try and investigate that. But in 1992, the first exoplanet was confirmed. This was actually orbiting a pulsar, so not even really uh, where we expected these exoplanets to be, around stars like our own sun. And then a few years later, the first uh, planet orbiting a sun-like star, 51 Peg B, uh, was confirmed. And we now know of more and more of these planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. This is an artist's impression, as was the last picture of these planets. It's very difficult to take pictures of planets orbiting around other stars. It's actually very difficult even to take pictures of planets orbiting around our own star. This is a picture from the Cassini spacecraft orbiting Saturn. And you can see that even from a billion miles away, here's planet Earth uh, to so to paraphrase Carl Sagan, or to, to steal Carl Sagan's uh, uh, line here, the pale blue dot. Uh, this wasn't the pale blue dot picture, but this, this is the Earth from a billion miles away. It's kind of a cool picture when you think that we're all in this picture as this little tiny dot. The spacecraft flew past Saturn, turned around, took this picture, beamed it back to Earth. But to see planets around stars that are trillions of miles away really is, is extremely challenging. It's kind of like taking a picture of a firefly flying around next to a searchlight. We do have tools that have enabled us to take pictures of planets around other stars, the Hubble Space Telescope many of you are familiar with. And there was a result um, from some folks in the astronomy department at Berkeley a few years back, um, uh, Paul Callas and James Graham, among others, uh, who actually directly imaged a planet orbiting the star Fommelhort. And so you can see how difficult this was. It moved uh, from 2004 to 2006. This is this little box blown up here. This is a coronagraphic image where the telescope blocks out the bright light from the parent star. And you can still see, still see a lot of scattered light coming from around the star here. And even so, this planet that's really very far out is so difficult to image. There's only 41 planets that have been discovered by direct imaging using this method. There's another method called the wobble method or the radial velocity method. And this essentially uh, uses the Doppler shift. It's the kind of change in pitch of a police car as it's going past you, which also happens to light as objects are moving towards and away from you. Many of you will have heard of redshift as distant galaxies are moving away very fast. Here, the change in color is actually equivalent to the change in color of my shirt if I'm walking towards you or walking away from you. It's actually walking pace. These stars are moving at about a meter per second as they're going backwards and forwards. They're very far away. They're light years away, but the change in velocity that we're measuring using these spectrographs is of the order of meters per second, the order of walking pace. And again, we can measure the change in color, the Doppler shift, using these instruments. It's kind of mind-blowing, the precision 
of the instruments that, that we have to do this. Around 600 planets have been discovered using the wobble or radial velocity method. Another very promising method that some of you will be familiar with, if some of you saw Isaac, Howard Isaacson's uh, talk here early on this year, Howard talked a little bit about this. This is the transit method where the planet passes between us and the star and we see a dip in the light due to the planet blocking out the light, some of the light of the parent star, and then it goes back up again as the planet goes past the star. So this is called a light curve that we see on the left here. You see the light is uh, constant until the planet goes between us and the star and then it dips down and then it comes back up again. Around 2,600 planets have been discovered this way. And actually the real uh, workhorse for discovering planets through the transit method is the Kepler satellite. You can see here an illustration from Bay Area, Bay Area artist Lynette Cook, again with some visualizations of what some of these planets might look like. So we don't have direct pictures, certainly not like this, of most of these planets, but we can infer their properties from the amount of dipping of the light as they cross their parent star. We can infer their properties from how fast they're moving around their parent star and from measurements of the, the stars that they go around themselves. And so we now know of around uh, 2,300 planets that have been confirmed with Kepler. And you can see here this graph uh, is only up to date as far as 2014. Uh, blue are these radial velocity or wobble measurements. Green are the transit measurements. And you can see that Kepler really blew everything else out of the water by 2014 when they confirmed the first big tranche of planets that were more confirmed earlier this year as well. Um, so we now know of thousands of planets going around other stars. We're really entering the era where these planets become routine. You'll see sort of in the New York Times on page 10, oh, we discovered another one, and this one was really weird because whatever, but most of them don't even make the news. We're just churning out planets day by day right now, uh, which is really different to how things were 40 years ago. What we're really looking for as scientists who care about the search for life beyond Earth is planets that live in their stars habitable zone, the zone where conditions are comfortable, where it's not too hot or it's not too cold. So some scientists call this the Goldilocks zone, where typically uh, liquid water could exist on the surface of the planet is sort of the definition that is used. And so depending on whether the star is hotter than the sun or cooler than the sun, uh, this can move the habitable zone in or out. You can see here a representation of our own solar system and where the planets are in the habitable zone. You'll see they've actually put Venus on the inside of the habitable zone here, although it's too hot for life because it has a runaway greenhouse effect. And Mars is towards the outside here, but Mars lost most of its atmosphere early on in its history. Uh, there may have been life there in the past. This is still an open question. There may still be life there now. We, we as yet, don't know. And you can see here the system Kepler-22, uh, which has a planet orbiting in the habitable zone. There are about 83 confirmed planets in their star's habitable zone now, and about 30 of them are comparable in size to the Earth. But again, these are hard to find. Out of thousands, we know of a few, and actually planets are easier to detect as they're closer to their parent star. Big planets closer to their parent star will have more of an effect on the light curve or on the radial velocity. So Earth-sized planets further out are harder to find, and you have to watch the star for longer in order to figure out that they're actually there. Planets in the habitable zone don't necessarily mean inhabited planets, and they don't even necessarily mean habitable planets. They're not necessarily planets where life could exist. Here are some examples uh, of what terrestrial exoplanets might look like. Some of them might be too hot or too cold. Uh, there's sort of an early Mars and early Earth analog here, jungle world, desert world. This is sort of, a, you know, again, an artist's impression of some ideas of what worlds might look like. Some of them are much bigger than the Earth, but nevertheless maybe could still uh, support life. Even our own Earth over time uh, has changed dramatically, and if you were to observe it from far away, then you would have observed very different conditions over time, and it's only really uh, when life arose on Earth that we started seeing significant, amount, significant amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere. But maybe this is something that we could measure from far away uh, to, to see whether there is oxygen there. But there are about 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, and the research over the past few years, particularly the research with Kepler, has shown us that most of these stars probably have planets. And many of them may have habitable planets. There actually may be around 40 billion habitable planets in our own galaxy, about one every five stars. And this is kind of interesting experiment. If you look up at the night sky and, I don't know, maybe pick 10 stars, two of them might have a habitable planet going around them. And this is not to mention things like moons. There's also research going into uh, whether moons, even in our own solar system, might have the conditions uh, right for life. Some of the moons of Jupiter, for example underneath a, a thick crust of ice, there may be a liquid ocean. 
So with all of this real estate out there, there's only a few thousand confirmed planets, but we infer that there are billions of them. The question arises, and it was posed uh, probably most famously by Enrico Fermi, where is everybody? <laughs> this is the Fermi paradox. Uh, if there's all this real estate for life, why doesn't life arise and why haven't we heard from it? Well, another way of looking at this is uh, due to this guy here, Frank Drake, and his famous Drake equation, which some of you will be familiar with, but I'm going to go through the, the terms here. This is an attempt to essentially parameterize our ignorance, to sort of put numbers on things that we know and things that we don't know, and to come up with a number of civilizations that we might be able to detect in our own galaxy if we were looking in the right place at the right time. And so we take the rate of formation of stars in our galaxy. We multiply that by the fraction of stars that have planets. We multiply that by the number of planets per star that are habitable. We multiply that by the fraction of habitable planets that give rise to life. We multiply that by the fraction of planets that give rise to life that give rise to intelligence. We multiply that by the fraction of intelligent civilizations that gain the ability to communicate. And here we're saying communicate in a way that we'd be able to pick up ourselves that we'd understand. And we multiply that by this last term, L, which is the lifetime of a transmitting civilization. Okay, so star formation rate, fraction of stars with planets, number of habitable planets per star, fraction of such planets that have life, fraction of such planets that have intelligence, fraction of such planets that develop, fraction of such intelligence that develops communication, and the lifetime of the civilization. And so eventually then, we'll come up with a number which tells us how many of these civilizations are in our galaxy. We'll get back to our best guesses of what this number might be. This is electron micrograph of E. coli, um, and we really wouldn't have much hope of talking to E. coli. Um, e. coli uh, is going about its own business. It's not even aware that we're there. We're sometimes aware that it is there, but it's probably all over this room right now, and now those of you who are germaphobes are probably getting a bit freaked out. But this is not the kind of life that we'd be able to communicate, but nevertheless, there may be simple organisms like this that arise elsewhere, and maybe we have a chance of finding such organisms. And of course, looking close to home is uh, one of the places that we want to look first. This is the Curio Curiosity rover, about the size of a Mini Cooper that's driving around on Mars right now. This picture wasn't taken on Mars, as you could probably tell. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we would have found intelligent life elsewhere, I guess. But, uh, this is in the Mars yard down at JPL. Uh, one of my colleagues got to go down there and, and uh, see the setup down there a few days ago, and I was very jealous. But uh, This is actually a photograph taken by the real Curiosity rover on Mars as it scoops down into the surface, gathers some soil, and analyzes it. It has a number of instruments uh, that analyze the composition of the soil there. And actually, it's added to the evidence that there is organic material on Mars, but there's organic material out there in space as well. And organics are not necessarily, they're a prerequisite for life, certainly life as we know it, but they're not necessarily evidence of life. Curiosity is added to the evidence that there were lakes and streams on Mars in the past. But again, we don't know if there is life there today. We're going to need to do more experiments, more thorough experiments to figure that out. But there is a chance that we could detect that oxygen in the atmosphere around some of these exoplanets. It's a very difficult measurement to make. But this little cartoon here uh, shows how you might break up the light from a star into its constituent colors, into a spectrum. And if there's a planet there, you get both the spectrum of the star and of the planet combined. And if it's a transiting planet, you just wait for the planet to go, not in front of the star, but behind it. So the light from the planet is lost, and you're just getting the spectrum of the star. And then you subtract those two. And what's left should be the spectrum of the planet. Again, very precision measurements, very hard to do. Uh, it has been done for just a handful of exoplanets. And as we get more technology, particularly with James Webb Space Telescope and some of these extremely large telescopes that are coming online, we'll be able to do such measurements for more and more stars and determine something about the, uh, the atmospheres of their planets. This is the kind of thing that you might expect, uh, again, sort of simulated images from uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars. If these were orbiting another star and you had precise enough measurements, you'd see the CO2 for Venus and Mars, but you might expect to see evidence of water and of uh, oxygen compounds uh, on, on the Earth, too. So what made alien life look like? Well, here's a few uh, examples from um, the mind of Hollywood here about the kind of crazy things that we might expect to see around other stars. Now, actually, these are all real organisms from the Earth. This is a catydid. That's a star-nosed mole. That's an eye-eye. And that's a tardigrade. These are real things that evolution has come up with on Earth. And so 
This is just the one example that we know of. There may be all sorts of weird stuff out there that we don't know about. And so again, really, are we going to be able to communicate? Will we know life when we find it? Well, we have to start by doing the experiment that we know how to do. And we have to look sort of under the street lamp for the keys, even though we may have lost the keys in the park, right? We have to look in the first place uh, where we have the best chance of, of finding it and to look using the techniques that we have. So let's come back to the Drake equation again and think about the terms that we do know in this equation and what we still have to figure out. Star formation rate. About seven stars per year in the Milky Way galaxy on average. Planet fraction. We now know from Kepler, almost all stars probably have planets. Again from Kepler, number of habitable planets per star, probably about 20%, uh, one, in, one in five. So this is again an average. And then multiplying those together, you're going to get a number that's roughly one. We don't know what fraction of planets give rise to life. We only have one example of a habitable planet that gave rise to life. We don't know whether the development of life towards intelligence is inevitable or whether it's rare. We don't know whether intelligence will necessarily result in transmissions that we could hope to uh, receive with the equipment that we have. But there's a number there that tells us, well, how likely is it that such a civilization would develop radio transmissions, for example, and we'll be able to pick those up. And then the lifetime of a civilization, the lifetime of a transmitting civilization, well, we've had about 100 years so far on Earth that we've been detectable, and it's anybody's guess as to how long that might last. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's sort of a pathway in the Drake equation to uh, to building a transmitter, essentially. Um, and so, you know, a dolphin, maybe we could say, is intelligent, but it's not going to build a radio transmitter. And so that then probably comes into the fraction of such intelligences that develop transmitters that we can pick up. And so rather than looking for these biosignatures, signatures of life around other stars, uh, signatures of the chemicals associated with life, we could instead skip right to the end of the Drake equation and look for techno signatures, signs of technology, signs that an extraterrestrial civilization has developed the means to uh, transmit or maybe to control its environment in some other way. And again, so there's some cartoons here, uh, some radio waves, maybe firing lasers, so using light, maybe using x-rays. Maybe they build these huge Dyson spheres around their stars. You could imagine a way of kind of harvesting the light from your parent star by building a, a shell around it. A huge engineering challenge, of course, nothing that we could accomplish ourselves, but a more advanced civilization might be able to do such a thing. So how do we find them? Well, again, we use the technology that we know how to use. And so we start off by uh, looking for radio waves. Um, you could try this at home. It probably wouldn't be very successful. Or you could try, as uh, Jodie Foster did in the movie Contact, going out to the very large array in New Mexico, plugging your laptop in and just listening. Actually, Jodie Foster's character uh, in Contact is based on, many of you will have heard of Jill Tarter at the SETI Institute. Um, she lives here with her husband, Jack Welch, in Berkeley. Um, we collaborate a lot with folks at the SETI Institute. Um, Jill works with the Allen Telescope Array up in, uh, near, near Lassen National Park, a few miles, a uh, few hours north of here. Uh, they're doing great work there, too. You should go to the SETI Institute colloquium series if you get a chance as well. They publish the information about that online. They're open to the public down in the South Bay. Um, but I want to focus today about the work that we're doing at Berkeley SETI Research Center. Many people think the SETI Institute and Berkeley SETI Research Center are the same thing. We're collaborators, but we're not... Uh, we're not the same organization. Berkeley SETI Research Center really got its start about 15 or so years ago with the SETI at Home project, which was taking data from the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. It's 1,000 feet across, and Dan Wertheim and my colleague mentioned that it holds 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. I actually went and checked, sort of did some rough math. It's more like 7 or 8 billion, I think. I guess you could kind of pile them up at the top. <laughs> Standard size, one cup servings. <laughs> well, it's 1,000 feet, and then I think, it's, uh, I think it turns out to be sort of a couple hundred feet deep. Um, uh, we also uh, more recently have started using the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. This is 330 feet across. It's fully steerable, unlike Arecibo, so you can point it anywhere uh, in the sky. Um, it weighs 8,500 tons. It's the largest movable structure on land. And uh, I was controlling it from my house this morning. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., uh, taking over from another colleague who was actually out in Green Bank. It's kind of cool how you can access these telescopes on the internet, uh, taking data 
for the Breakthrough Listen project that I'm going to tell you about. I'm actually flying out there tomorrow to visit the telescope for the first time as well. I've not been there even though I've worked with it for several months now. How do we find ET? Well, again, somebody smarter than me, Carl Sagan, once said, the only significant test of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence is an experimental one. We just have to go out and do the experiment. And so I want to do a little experiment to try and detect intelligence here today. I have uh, this little box here and an antenna. This is called a software-defined radio. Uh, you can get them online, now on sale. They were $50 and now they're $33. You can actually get them for under $20. This one's in an aluminum case, so it's a little fancier. I'm going to plug this back in again and I'm going to do uh, what people say you should never do during a talk and that's attempt to do a live demo here. This is this program called GQRX. It's a little complicated, but hopefully this will work. I'm going to unplug this. Maybe like KQED? <laughs> I'm not getting a very good reception in here, but... Oh, there we go. Put another window. So I'm going to turn this down a little bit and explain to you what you're seeing here. So what you're seeing here is called a waterfall plot. And this software-defined radio is taking an analog signal from this antenna and it's digitizing it. Actually, a lot of the work is going on on the computer here. And I'm tuned in to 88.5 megahertz in the FM band. And I've discovered signs of intelligent life. Now... <laughs> It's coming from just across the bay, but, but still, this is a, a good signal to be able to pick up. If I drag this off the band here, you just start hearing the background static. I mean, you're seeing some other stuff scrolling down here. So we're seeing frequency horizontally here, and we're seeing time as it's scrolling down, and then the colors here are representing the power that is coming in through the antenna. And you can see that there's a narrow range of frequencies where there is always emission. KQED is transmitting in this narrow range of frequencies. And then there are other frequencies where there's not so much going on. So if you're tuning between the band, imagine, you know, particularly those of you with the sort of old school radios in your car where you turn a little, little knob. If you're driving through the desert somewhere, um, you know, you're out in the middle of Nevada, say, and you're not picking up anything, you might conclude that there's no intelligence out there until you sort of come over the, the crest of a hill and you know, Las Vegas is in sight and you pick up a radio station and then, okay, now suddenly I'm detecting uh, signs of, of life out there. And so the absence of a detection is not necessarily evidence that there's nothing there, but you have to be tuned to the right place at the right time. And these so-called waterfall plots, again, you can see up at the top there, this graph that is showing sort of a cross-section through this waterfall plot, the instantaneous power, and then it's scrolling down with time. We're going to come back to that um, as I show you uh, a little bit more about kind of what we can do uh, with our equipment. So we can sometimes find information from radio waves that we may be able to decode. It's not necessarily sound. It may be other data that's being transmitted. But even without being able to decode this, I don't speak Spanish, but if I tuned into a Spanish language station, then you would still know that this was a sign of intelligence out there, even if you don't understand the language that's being used. And again, this is the hope um, of the SETI program, basically. So I'm going to go back to my talk. All as we do is we switch out this for the Greenwing telescope. So we get a little bit uh, better signal to noise with the collecting area there, uh, 100 meters. Uh, we switch out this for this uh, server rack that's installed at Greenbank. This has uh, 444 5 terabyte drives for a total of 2.2 petabytes of storage. Uh, there's 18 servers in this rack, and it can do uh, 100 teraflops, 100, uh, well, 100, 10 to the 14 floating off operations, floating point operations per second. This is the breakthrough lesson equipment at Greenbank. So this is really kind of uh, bringing uh, the power of this uh, computing technology to the search, where rather than just tuning to one channel at a time, we can tune to billions of channels across the spectrum, and point the telescope at different places in the sky and see if we can pick up uh, signs of transmissions that are coming from planets going around other stars. Uh, this was launched 
Um, last year, last July, uh, even before I started working for Breakthrough Listen, I was working a little bit for Berkeley SETI Research Center, and uh, my boss, Andrew Simeon, kind of pushed me out the door to go and appear on Fox Business News. Uh, I think they were interested in this number here, the $100 million. That's probably why they, they called. Yuri Milner, an internet entrepreneur in the South Bay, donated uh, $100 million for a 10-year project um, that really aims to kind of change the, uh, the game in terms of trying to find extraterrestrial civilizations. Some of that money is flowing through Berkeley. Certainly not all 100 million is flowing through, flowing through Berkeley. Um, a lot of it is going to actually purchase time on telescopes. So Breakthrough Listen has purchased 20% of the time on the Green Bank Telescope. It's purchased time on the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. Uh, the telescopes are happy about this, the management, because a lot of these telescopes are actually under financial pressure because of uh, competition uh, for, for funding, for government funding. And so it's sort of a win-win for the telescopes and, uh, and for the scientists. Um, we're also working with the automated planet finder up at Lick Observatory, and I'll mention that a little bit later. That's an optical search. Yeah, these telescopes are not so much underutilized, um, so there still is competition, and they still are awarding on Green Bank 80% of the time through a competitive process. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope is oversubscribed by a factor of seven or eight. Um, some other telescopes are oversubscribed by a, a smaller factors. If the telescope goes away for lack of funding, then nobody gets any data. And so the reason why they were willing to take the money is because uh, otherwise, the, particularly Arecibo, Arecibo is still under threat of, of closure. Um, and we can't pay for all the telescopes. But uh, you know, the Breakthrough Listen is paying for access to, to some of them and probably sort of more with time as well coming along. Um, so the raw data that, that are coming out of the telescopes, about 200 terabytes per day. Uh, eventually we'll be going up to around a petabyte a day as the servers are expanded. That was actually uh, one quarter of the system that I showed you in the, the last picture. So we need to reduce these data volumes pretty dramatically. We need to reduce them really to a few petabytes per year to even have a hope of, store, of storing them. I want to show you some of the breakthrough lesson data. You're among the first people to actually see um, some real uh, data from GreenBank from Breakthrough Listen. Again, this is just like the software to find radio image that you just looked at. So we're seeing frequencies here. Here it's much higher frequencies. We're looking from about 2300 to 2500 megahertz. And again, you're looking at time going along the vertical axis here, about five minutes of data from GreenBank. And again, it looks like we detected something here. There's some weird stuff going on. So could that be ET? Well, we need to do a little bit more work before we jump to conclusions. And part of the issue is that if you look at the number of transmitters that are out there at a range of frequencies. There's an awful lot of people that are transmitting at an awful lot of frequencies. Signs of intelligent life are all over the place, but again, it's mostly us. It's mostly our own terrestrial radio frequency interference, or RFI, as we call it. And you can see uh, the bits that are allocated to radio astronomy. Actually, there's a couple of other things that are in yellow here. So even all the yellow bits are not all radio astronomy. There are some reserved bands, um, but there's a lot of other transmissions. And even at Green Bank, the Green Bank Telescope, which is in the middle of the National Radio Quiet Zone. Uh, this is a, um, a region where actually uh, your uh, cell phone, garage door opener, uh, Wi-Fi, even microwaves are essentially banned uh, by the FCC uh, to protect the sensitive radio astronomy observations. Even there at Green Bank, things like satellites can be problematic. You have satellites flying overhead, and they're once they're above the horizon, if they're in your band, then you pick them up. So did we find ET in this case? Well, rather than just looking at the star and sort of guessing whether what we see might be extraterrestrial, we can actually do a comparison by pointing at the star for five minutes and then moving the telescope a little bit and pointing at a nearby spot on the sky for five minutes. Then we could move back to the star again for five minutes and then move away for five minutes. And we actually do, this is the observing program that we do at Green Bank. We do three of these on-off cycles. So here is on, here is off. Well, you can't really tell by looking at this whether any of these things are ET. Presumably the ones in the off pointing are not, unless ET is sort of floating out there somewhere in space and not on a planet. But by comparing the on minus off, essentially you could sort of do SETI by I here. Here are the ons at the top. Here are the offs at the bottom for this particular star. And I don't see anything that's convincingly there in the on observations and not there in the observations. There's some weird things in both, but they seem to be in both and not convincingly in, in one or the other. So again, here's some stuff in the off that sort of looks like that. Um, and generally, uh, at least to sort of 
first order, one of the things that we want to do is to compare these ons and offs and to see are the things that are just associated with particular stars, and then that would be a pretty exciting signal. So we can now point the telescope because we have our own time on GBT. SETI at Home has been analyzing data from the Arecibo telescope for uh, about 15 years. SETI at Home can't point to Arecibo, it's just piggybacking on the Arecibo radio telescope, but it can still look for interesting signals. You can all join SETI at Home, it's this distributed computing project. Hundreds of thousands of vol volunteers are running a screensaver on their home computer and analyzing little chunks of data from Arecibo and now actually the breakthrough lesson data from the Green Bank Telescope as well as going out to these volunteers. All of these computers combined together, each of them gets a little bit of work from a server in Berkeley. It does a little bit of crunching on that server, on that, on that work, and then it sends it back to the server and reports what it's found. And currently the combined computing power of SETI at home is about uh, three quarters of a petaflop. So uh, even more than the, the equipment that we have at Green Bank. Over the Last 15 years, SETI at Home has performed, uh, I got this number from Eric Korpola, who is the director of SETI at Home. I got this from him yesterday, and he said his estimate was uh, about five times 10 to the 22 floating point operations. And I asked him, is that the biggest computation that's ever been done? And he said, well, he thinks Bitcoin is now bigger, apparently. The Bitcoin computations that do the, the Bitcoin blockchain is now a bigger computation than SETI at Home, so for what it's worth. So it's looking for various kinds of signals. I have an example of one of the kinds of signals that uh, SETI at Home looks for here, and it's a triplet, and so this is just uh, time and power, and you see these little spikes, and it's sort of the SETI at Home client has found some spikes that it says, well, these are interesting because they're evenly spaced in time, and then it reports that back uh, to the server in Berkeley. There's about, uh, I think the latest number was something like 14 billion candidate signals in the SETI at Home database, and we don't think there are 14 billion signals from ET out there, and again, this is just illustrating how difficult it is to find this needle in a haystack, right? The, the haystack is our own radio frequency interference, and the needle is the signal from ET that we're looking for, which looks pretty much like the haystack. And so we really need to do a better job of distinguishing these, and actually in the past sort of year or so, we've really been ramping up, first of all, analysis of the SETI at home database, the signals that are in there, and secondly, ramping up the techniques that we're going to use with the breakthrough lesson data. And we've been really helped in this by um, some of the new techniques that are coming out of Silicon Valley, in particular machine learning. This is a screenshot of a GitHub page if any of you are uh, on GitHub and want to go and kind of dig around in some of the machine learning stuff that we started off doing. We had some folks from the Jet Propulsion Lab come up a couple of weeks back who are machine learning experts. We had a guy from IBM. We had uh, some other folks come and chat with us about how we might hope to analyze our data. They gave some presentations. We ran some really preliminary analysis on some of the breakthrough listen data. But the idea is here basically that if you can teach a machine to think, then it can do those comparisons for you. It can look through and say, wait a minute, I see something odd here uh, that doesn't look like the rest of the data. Maybe it's just comparing the on minus off. Maybe it's looking for kind of other subtleties in the data and it's determining, okay, I mean, Google can find pictures of cats using machine learning. You type cats into Google and it, it gives you a million pictures of cats. Um, you type uh, cars into Google, it gives you thousands of pictures of cars. And so what we want to be able to do essentially is to sort of build the equivalent where we type ET into our server and it gives us all the detections that look like ET. And really, you know, that's the hope sort of over the next few years that we can do that. Just uh, by way of illustration here are some of the results that came out, these preliminary results that came out from our machine learning workshop. Um, I won't try and explain sort of what's going on here other than to say that one of the pieces of code found some signals that it said, well, these look kind of like the same sort of signal. It's clustering signals. It's performing a clustering analysis. Uh, this one is going through these waterfall plots one by one and saying, does this next waterfall plot that I'm seeing look like all the ones that I've seen previously or does it look different? And then it's finding residuals between sort of its model, what it expects to see and what it does actually see. This is some analysis of the SETI at home database, which sort of looks more like a kind of fourth graders artwork, but um, it's looking for patterns essentially here that I believe are, uh, so this is, I'm not going to go into this, <laughs> but you can ask me afterwards. It, it, it's sort of to do with the way that the telescope surveys the sky that it found these patterns that, that cluster together. So back to breakthrough lesson, uh, as I said, it's a hundred million dollar project over 10 years that aims to survey a million stars and 100 galaxies, and really once this is fully up and running, one day of data from Breakthrough Listen will be equivalent to a year of any previous search. And the plan is to make more of the scientific data from this search publicly available than any other project has done. We're really trying to get as much data out there to the public as possible. These are the telescopes. 
the automated planet finder at Lick Observatory, and so this is not doing a radio search, it's looking for optical line emission. I'll come back to what we think, why, why we think an optical search is worthwhile. I mentioned the Green Bank Telescope, and then uh, in the fall, in the Northern Hemisphere fall, this year we'll be bringing on the Parkes Telescope in Australia. Again, a telescope that has been had some funding issues uh, even very recently, but we're hopeful that Breakthrough Listen can really kind of help uh, keep the telescope going, and we're going to be using uh, this for the uh, radio searches as well. I wanted to show you another waterfall plot. This one is kind of cool from, uh, from Breakthrough Listen at Green Bank. This is the Voyager 1 spacecraft. So again, you can see frequency here, frequency in gigahertz, 8.4 gigahertz, pretty narrow channels here in time. I think this is time in seconds. And this kind of pulsing signal in the middle here is Voyager 1. 12 billion miles from Earth. It's the most distant human-made object. And it has a 20 watt radio transmitter, so about the same power as a fridge light. And it's picked up here clearly by, by our instruments, by the Green Bank Telescope. And so this is sort of illustrating what's possible in terms of detecting uh, signs of intelligence from far away. Now, of course, as I mentioned, ET is going to be thousands of times further away than this, but hopefully they're broadcasting uh, correspondingly brighter. Yeah. Again, for those of you that are interested, we're making data public. We've made the Voyager 1 data public. If some of you, again, are on GitHub or if you care about, uh, if you know a little bit about Python, then you can go and grab the data and have a play around with it, see what you can see. Not just the Voyager data, this is sort of taking you through how we do the analysis, but uh, other data that's in our archive. And so I wanted to move on to talk a little bit about the laser searches. So maybe ET isn't using radio waves, maybe they're using lasers to communicate. These aren't actually communication lasers, these are lasers that are being used by the Keck telescopes in this picture uh, to make sharper images of the center of the galaxy. This is a laser adaptive optics system. But maybe you can imagine hooking up a powerful laser to a powerful telescope and using that to transmit information either intentionally to communicate with, uh, maybe they're intentionally beaming signals towards Earth, or maybe we could kind of catch, particularly if two planets, two transiting planets were lining up and we see them from Earth going around their parent star, maybe they're communicating with each other and we could sort of capture some of the uh, kind of spillover if we're in the line of sight. And so, how do we do this? Well, again, we're breaking the light up into a spectrum, into its constituent frequencies, wavelengths, constituent colors. This is just an example of a spectrum that I pulled off the internet. This is actually a galaxy spectrum. And you can see, so you have a slit in the spectrum. You put that on the, uh, on the, the object that you're interested in, and it splits the light up into this rainbow of colors. You see the light from the object here, this galaxy in the middle. You can see emission lines at certain frequencies that are associated with particular elements in the spectrum of this galaxy. And then you see these lines here that are lines from our own Earth's atmosphere from the night sky. And so you want to sort of be able to subtract those lines and to look at the spectrum of the object of interest. And indeed, this is how the automated planet finder finds the planets. It subtracts the skylines off, it looks at the spectrum from the star, and it looks for tiny motions of lines like this from side to side, again, measuring these sort of lines to meter per second precision. But we're not interested in breakthrough listen um, so much in the measurements of the star itself. We're interested in whether we might find something that's a little bit offset from the star that is at a narrow range of frequencies and also is confined in a narrow region of space. And maybe that could be a laser that's being transmitted from a planet going around this star. Again, you can see some kind of blobs here in the image. Maybe those are good candidates. Again, this is interference. This isn't interference from cell phones or garage door openers. This is interference from cosmic rays, high energy particles, which hit the detector and deposit their energy in the detector and leave these little cosmic ray spikes. We don't want to confuse one of those for a laser, but the way that we can distinguish them is that cosmic rays typically don't get sort of broadened out by the instrument. The instrument has a certain uh, width that it broadens out the incoming light into a certain point spread function, as we call it. And so even sort of a, a laser shining in through the telescope would be broadened a little bit rather than these cosmic rays, which just look like kind of individual hot pixels here. Uh, the idea here behind the algorithms is to build an algorithm that can find uh, things that are consistent with being laser light uh, from, uh, from a planet going around another star. Here's a picture of the automated planet finder. The spectra don't look quite like the, spectra that I sh the spectrum that I showed you in the last picture. They're actually split up because we split the light up into such a um, fine, rain fine wavelength resolution, really splitting it up so it's, it's spread out hugely. 
this is actually a spectrum from the APF. It's been sort of color coded here, but you can see basically you read these like a book. And so it takes an individual chunk of the spectrum and then the next chunk is down underneath that and the next chunk and so on and so on. And so imagine sort of this like a ticker tape, basically you could stick all of these end to end and have a huge spectrum spread out. These are emission lines in the spectrum uh, here that again could be used for detecting whether the star is moving towards or away from us. And again here, you know, you, you sort of see the challenge in this is then finding something that looks a little bit offset and it looks like a, a laser signal in here amongst this sort of forest of lines. So again, we're making data public. There's a couple of folks in here um, who have been looking at the data. So we have a, already a high schooler here. Maybe he can tell you more about this uh, later if you're interested in talking to David there at the back. He's been downloading some APF data from our public archive and having a look at it and trying to figure out uh, if he can sort of write some code to, to help with the search here. So you can get involved. You can get involved if you have these skills. We're, we're really trying to get our undergraduates involved. Uh, an undergraduate actually wrote this tutorial. Haynes Stevens is an undergrad who was working with us this summer who went through and designed this tutorial to tell you this is how the data work, this is how we analyze it, and again, this is all sort of posted publicly where you can get at it. The timeline for Breakthrough Listen uh, was announced last July, and then we really started instrumentation development and observation planning in, er in earnest in August. Observations began with the Green Bank Telescope and with APF in early 2016, and then in October, we're planning to bring on uh, the Parkes Telescope, and you'll start seeing Parkes data flowing too. Yeah. We have a number of samples, including uh, stars that are close to Earth, known planets going around other stars, sun-like stars, other galaxies. We're really trying to sort of do a mixed bag. There are uh, several subsets, and we're trying to cover, we're, we're trying not to be too biased in terms of how we design the samples, basically. Again, sort of to get back to the, the Fermi paradox that I mentioned earlier, uh, where is everybody? Well, again, to quote Jill Tata, Jill has a nice analogy where she says, imagine you took a glass of water to the beach or to a lake, and you picked up a glass of water out of the lake and looked at the glass, and you saw no fish in the glass and concluded there were no fish in the lake or in the ocean. We've really surveyed such a small region. We haven't found anything yet, but we're gathering more and more data. We're really trying to sort of bring bigger buckets along or a bigger net and to fish through more of this and to do it in a more intelligent way. Uh, and we're really hopeful that um, over the next few years that this field will go in the same way as planets went from a single detection on the front page of the New York Times and then a few years later another detection on the front page of the New York Times. We're hoping in a few years that ET will be on page 10. You know, a, a really weird ET was discovered last week by <laughs> scientists at Berkeley City Research Center or whatever. And I think you know, when, when we reach that level, then we'll really uh, begin to understand our place in the universe a little more. Of course, you know, this is a difficult experiment where there's no guarantee of success, but we're excited about the possibility of learning more about uh, our own place in the universe, about how life got started on Earth, and about uh, whether it's common elsewhere. If you're interested in keeping up uh, with what we're doing, we have uh, Facebook Twitter and Instagram feeds, uh, and we have a couple of websites that I've listened here. This, uh, this participate link, you can download the SETI at home screensaver. Uh, the slash listen link here has some information about our data formats. Uh, you can get access to the data archive. You can get onto our GitHub repository where our code and documentation is stored. We're excited to have the support and interest from the general public, and we hope um, also since I'll be here kind of in future months as well. You can just come and bug me and ask me, ask me about what's going on. But uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. How far could we detect the signals? Uh, it kind of depends on how bright the transmission is. Um, so we're not yet at a stage where we could detect the Earth um, even sort of relatively close by. I actually have, uh, funny you should ask this, um, a slide with the Square Kilometre Array, which is this big radio telescope that's being built in South Africa and Western Australia. This is a slide from Andrew Simeon, the director of Berkeley SETI. And here is um, the minimum detectable uh, emitted isotropic radio power. So in other words, if this was just going out in all directions, and this is uh, in strange astronomy units of ergs per second, um, but he has uh, some lines here that are showing basically the sensitivity of these various instruments. And so Arecibo here and GBT, these orange and green lines here, 
So essentially, faint, faint signals are towards the bottom of this, this plot. Bright signals are towards the top. And then we have frequency here. And this is uh, the, you know, the, the power, basically, that's being emitted. And this, this little kind of cartoon here is intended to show somebody transmitting with the Arecibo telescope at their end. So they're using Arecibo as a transmitter, and we're using it as a receiver, essentially like sort of two cans and a piece of string, right? They're talking to us with their Arecibo. We're picking up with ours. And that would easily be detectable. Even right across the other side of the galaxy, we could easily detect Arecibo pointed directly at us. Uh, this is intended to show an airport radar here, um, 10 to the 17 ergs per second. And you can see an airport radar, which are sort of among the most powerful transmitters that we have on Earth that are kind of broadcasting in all directions, is too faint to be picked up. Um, by Arecibo on the GBT. I think this is for, if I'm remembering right, this is for a star at 50 parsecs. So if it's a little bit closer, then you could detect it a little bit better. 50 light years, thank you. Right, it's on the slide. <laughs> um, uh, with a signal to noise of 15 in a 10 minute integration. So you can sort of move some of these things around a little bit. But, so we may be able to detect sort of the, the equivalent of airport radar from nearby stars, but we don't know sort of what ET is using to transmit, it may be way brighter than that, it may be way fainter. These quantities may change over time, and so habitable planets are maybe less likely to give rise to life earlier in the universe because the ingredients aren't there, and actually maybe habitable planets are less likely to be around earlier in the universe. So you can imagine some time dependence of the terms in the Drake equation, certainly. I think for the present day, you know, again, we can measure those numbers uh, at the beginning pretty precisely, and we hope to have an answer of some of the numbers towards the end pretty soon. There is an idea that if we detect ET, it will likely be uh, millions, if not billions of years more advanced than us. And the, the reason why we think that is because we've had technology for about 100 years, and again, assuming that, that, that we don't wipe ourselves out in the next 100 years, which as I alluded to is you know, not a, a you know, negligible risk, um, but assuming that we last for a long period of time, I mean, let's say uh, technology lasts for millions of years, the chance of finding another civilization that is so early on in its development as we are is pretty slim if you believe that they're distributed kind of randomly. Now, I agree, maybe we're the first because it's just so hard to overcome all of those other hurdles. There's actually, you may want to Google the great filter. So there's this idea that, um, you know, there's, there's some filter basically that's responsible. I don't really buy this, but there may be some filter that life has to pass through in order to get to the stage where it can be a technological civilization that's transmitting. And the question is, you know, this answers the Fermi uh, uh, paradox by saying either that filters in our past and we're very lucky to be here and that's why we haven't heard from anyone else, or it's in our future and we're going to wipe ourselves out pretty soon and that's why we haven't heard from anybody. But I think we haven't heard from anybody because we haven't really done a thorough search yet. Uh, to answer the second part of your question, um, in terms of the propagation speed, even if life on Earth were to end tomorrow, we're, our radio waves are still propagating out into the universe. So there's, a, there's still a chance that somebody could pick us up, even a very distant from Earth. And so, you know, in the same way that we see supernovae that exploded thousands of years ago, the star is not there anymore at some level, but we still might get the signal. People were saying to the planet hunters years ago, well, what if there are no other planets going around other stars? Or, you know, what if they're all hot Jupiters and there are no Earth-like planets or, you know, there's a number of object objections, but until you find one and then you start finding dozens of them, then, yeah, I totally, totally agree. In terms of things that aren't optical or radio, really, th these are sort of our best guess with our current understanding of technology about ways you can transmit over long distances and ways where we could build big detectors to actually pick up faint signals. Um, so. I mean, people sometimes will email me and say, hey, what if ET is using tachyons to communicate? To which I reply, build me a tachyon detector and we'll include it in the search. But, you know, and, until we can do that, then we, we just have to do what we know how to do. And this is sort of controversial. So SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, um, there's also METI, messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence. And there are people even here in the Bay Area who would disagree with the stand that I take on this, um, which is that we should listen first. Um, the idea, I mean, Stephen Hawking has sort of uh, said that there may be a threat um, from extraterrestrials. Now, it may be very small, um, but maybe broadcasting our presence before we know what's out there is not, uh, not a good idea. I mean, if you look at sort of what's happened uh, to some civilizations on Earth um, when other 
civilizations have come along and, and discovered them, um, then it's not necessarily ended well. So we just want to be a little bit kind of circumspect. This sort of goes back to what I was saying about how difficult it is to image other planets. Um, that even our best images of other planets is just a tiny little dot. And so getting the light from that and splitting it up into its constituent colors and trying to figure out, I mean, really, you know, for anything outside of our own solar system, you're not probably going to detect the life itself. You're going to uh, detect the influence that it's had on its environment, be that producing oxygen in the atmosphere, or maybe you'll detect kind of chlorophyll maybe from the sort of overall kind of color of the, uh, the planet at some level, or things like that. I mean, of course, you know, and that it may be that chlorophyll or things like it don't develop uh, elsewhere. And so, you know, if I had to guess, then I would say we'll find intelligent life elsewhere before we find simple life elsewhere. I think the, the odds are, uh, are better for finding intelligence just because of the nature of the search and, and how comparatively easy it is. Now, you know, if life is very common in the universe, if it's arisen elsewhere in our own solar system, then maybe we'll find evidence on Mars or on Europa or somewhere else in our own solar system. But I think it's going to be pretty challenging uh, to find it outside our own solar system, personal opinion. What's next? Yeah, uh, so confirmation, first of all. I mean, you don't want to sort of put out a press release and uh, then have to retract it later. So we would essentially call up people on other telescopes and have them follow up the observation in sort of independent ways. Um, if it's confirmed, then we would put out a press release and sort of uh, be as public as possible again. I mean, you know, all of the data are going as I mentioned, into the archive. I mean, this was a sort of a commitment from the sponsor that he wanted things to be public. So we're not trying to hide anything. But in terms of the analysis and, and what we detect, you know, we would make an announcement. And it kind of depends on the nature of the signal. If it was just detecting uh, something that maybe was not intended for us, maybe we're just sort of picking up you know, the equivalent of their KQED or, or whatever it is, maybe we wouldn't be able to understand it. But we'd recognize it as artificial. Whereas if it's something that is deliberately, as we say, anti-cryptographic, in other words, uh, not intended to hide the information, but intended to make it easy to understand, you could imagine you know, it might be a series of pulses corresponding to prime numbers, or it might be um, you know, the digits of pi or, or something. And, and in that case, you know, I, mean, I think there would be efforts to understand what the transmission is, but uh, it's anybody's guess as to how successful that would be. And it depends on sort of whether we are even kind of thinking on the same wavelength, if you like as ET might be. Um, so the main funder is Yuri Milner, uh, this internet billionaire. Um, and he supports the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, which he's described as being like the American Nobels. He wants, uh, and actually it's sort of more money than, than the Nobel Prize is. Um, so he's also given um, $100 million recently to the Breakthrough Starshot project, which again, you can go and read about online. Berkeley's not involved with it. Well, I guess some people in the physics department are involved. And this is the idea that you might be able to send a tiny spacecraft uh, at a significant fraction of the speed of light to Alpha Centauri. You, you should Google this. Uh, and it's, you know, it's wild. I mean, it's a wild idea. Clearly, this is a guy who thinks big. And he also apparently thinks in units of $100 million. So if you have a $100 million wild idea, then you know, pick up the phone and, and uh, call Yuri Milner. OK, shall we uh, wrap up?